SCHD, the Schwab U.S. Dividend Equity ETF, is by far the most popular and most well-known dividend ETF. It has consistently in the past outperformed other dividend ETFs and even at times the S&P 500 on both dividend income and portfolio balance. But this year has been a little bit different for SCHD. It hasn't done quite as well. And it may or may not be due to the most recent reconstitution that occurred earlier this year. So I decided to dig a little bit deeper. This is by far the most comprehensive deep dive of any ETF or stock I've ever done. So let's take a look under the hood. What's up, you guys? Welcome back to the Average Joe Investor channel. You're looking at the spreadsheet I created for my deep dive analysis of Schwab's SCHD, this spreadsheet, and all of the spreadsheets I use and create along with my monthly dividend stock spreadsheet, access to all of my trades, tons of value, is available to you if you're a member of the Average Joe Investor Patreon community. If you want to learn more about joining, check out the link down in the description below. So a little bit of general information about SCHD. It's got a total expense ratio of 0.06%, and it's based on the Dow Jones U.S. Dividend 100 Index. There are currently 104 holdings in SCHD, and it was launched in October of 2011. Current distribution yield based on the trailing 12 months is 3.62%. And it regularly pays quarterly dividends in March, June, September, and December. One of the things I've loved about SCHD historically is their dividend growth rate. You can see the 10, 5, and 3-year growth rates here. The 10-year dividend growth rate is 11.39%. The 5-year growth rate, 13.05%. The three-year growth rate, 9.43% on average. And you can see, though, you know, over the trailing 12 months, it's only 3.77%. So we're seeing a slowdown of the dividend growth rate. Here's a look at the top 10 holdings. We're going to deep dive these holdings here shortly. But top ones go to Broadcom, Texas Instruments, AbbVie, Home Depot, Amgen, Merck & Company, Cisco, Chevron, Pepsi, Coca-Cola. And you can see the sector breakdown definitely weighted in industrials and healthcare, followed by financials, then consumer staples, information technology, and then energy. You can also see the majority of these companies are large companies with with a market capitalization over $70 billion. All right, let's dive into this spreadsheet here. This is a breakdown of all 104 holdings. Actually, I think 101, 102. I, I left out like the mini indexes, etc. But essentially, this is all of the stocks in the ETF. You've got the weighting right here of assets, their total return for the year, as well as their cumulative weighting starting from the first one down. So the first two make up 8%, the top three make up 12.89%, the top four make up 17%, etc. You'll notice that the top, what is it here, approximately 13 stocks make up 50% of the weighted assets. With the top 23 stocks, you get 75% of the weighted assets in the ETF. And if you go all the way down here to the top 50, you get 93.91% of the assets. In other words, the majority of the movement of the stock, the dividend, etc., is built into these top 50 holdings. So, I looked at every single one of the top 50 holdings and all of their data is plugged in here. I just didn't have the time or the energy to go here and go to all these stocks here, which make up less than six, 7% of the portfolio. So before we dive into that information, here's a brief look at the SCHD methodology from their website and their regulatory documents. It invests in the Dow Jones US Dividend 100 Index right here. And with this index, they hope to measure the performance of high dividend yielding stocks issued by US companies, okay? not foreign companies, U.S. companies that have a record of consistently paying dividends selected for their fundamental strength. First note here is there are no real estate investment trusts or master limited partnerships or preferred stocks or convertibles in this index. And it's a modified market capitalization weighted ETF, meaning that it's weighted by assets, but also there are additional weightings based on sectors of the economy. To be eligible for the index, eligible stocks must have sustained at least 10 consecutive years of dividend payments, not dividend growth, okay? So not growth their dividend a year, just paying a consistent dividend for at least 10 years. Additionally, you have to have a minimum market cap of $500 million. The majority of these companies are much bigger than that. And they have to meet minimum liquidity criteria, meaning they have to trade enough and be liquid enough in order to be in the index. Then from this group, they then rank them based on fundamentals-based characteristics, including cash flow to debt, total debt, return on equity, dividend yield, and the five-year dividend growth rate. And then from there, the top 100 taken, no single stock can represent more than 4% of the index, and no single sector can represent more than 25% of the index. 
it is reconstituted or adjusted, stocks included or removed from the index on an annual basis, and the existing index is rebalanced quarterly. So here are all of the 50 different stocks in SCHD. And you can see we've got the weightings right here. We're gonna look at the year-to-date total return of each of these stocks, their total income based on some assumptions, which I'll cover in a second, the price only return, the total return, their actual weighted return based on how they're weighted in the index, their expected return based on their weighting, and based on that expected weighted return, was it a surplus or an over-the-top return or did it fall short? And then from there, we'll look at some of the data, which is graphed, which always gives a little bit of extra clarity. All right, so right now we are sorted based on percentage of assets, okay? So from there, you can see that the top weighted assets right here, we've got one, two, I put this in tier. So the, the, the stocks in the ETF that are weighted 4% or higher, make up a total of six. And of those six, there's clearly one stock that just truly outperformed all the others. And that goes for the entire index as well. And that is Broadcom, AVGO. Had a year-to-date total return when you factor in reinvested dividends of 109.21%. Oh, and on that note, so when we look at the data here, I assumed that at the beginning of the period, year-to-date 2023, a $1,000 lump sum investment was made into each of these stocks. Okay, and then from there, all dividends were reinvested during the year and no additional contributions were made. So when I talk about you know how much income was earned and what the total balance was, assume that we started with $1,000. So Broadcom returned 109% this year, which was by far the highest return. And if I sort it here based on total returns, the second place was Williams-Sonoma, WSM at 82%. Third best was Blackstone at 78%. Fourth was Watsco, WSO at 72.55%. From there, we had a big drop off. We had 42% for Fast, 40% for FNF. Packaging Corp of America returned 31%. SNA returned 29%. Of all the top 50 stocks in the ETF, the top 29 of them, 29 of those 50 stocks did have positive returns. However, as you can see right here, the S&P 500 total return for the year was 26.8% during that same time frame, which means of the 50 stocks we looked at, which make up 94% of all of the assets for SCHD, only eight of the 50 stocks we looked at actually outperformed the S&P 500 on a total return basis. When we look at the worst stocks in the index from a performance standpoint, we can see here that there's one clear, massive outlier, and that is Pfizer, ticker symbol PFE. It makes up a significant portion of the assets too, and it's one of the reasons why I believe SCHT underperformed you know, the S&P 500 and other ETFs potentially for the year, 3.55% of the index, and it had a total return of negative 42% on the year, generated $32 in income. And then from there, the next worst here was a 14% loss for, for all three of these, Amcor, Kelanova, and Tyson Foods, 12% losses for Key Corp and Newmont, 9% loss for Kimberly Clark, 9% also for Chevron, 3M lost 6%, UPS also lost 6%. And if we sort this all by percentage of assets here, just from the top here, you know, the top return was definitely Broadcom at 109%, then Home Depot at 4.2% of the assets made had a return of 13.65%, AbbVie lost 1%, Texas Instruments gained 8%, Merck was down half a percent, Amgen was up 12%. Avgo had a significant impact on this ETF for the year. If you didn't have Avgo, it would have been a big problem. And one of the ways I like to measure that here is kind of a new way of looking at it here. It's the weighted return surplus and shortfall. So let me break this down for you. You've got your actual weighted return, which I took the total return right here and multiplied by the weighting in the asset. Then what I said was, well, based on the actual weighting in the in the index and a thousand dollar starting point, you would expect the, the weighted return to be somewhere around 44.80. But you can see that 9372 was a dramatic outperformance by Broadcom. So it performed 109% better than what we would have expected if it had done just okay or average. From that standpoint, if we look at the top returns here based on the weighted surplus and shortfall, uh, William Sonoma here makes up only 0.4% of the assets, but it outperformed its expected return by 82%, followed closely by Blackstone at 78%, and then 72% for Watsco. The biggest losers from the standpoint, from a shortfall perspective, were by far 42% Pfizer. It makes up 3.55% of the assets, and it had a dramatic underperformance based on its weighting of 42%. 
followed by here a number of 14% underperformances with Amcor, Kelanova, Tyson Foods. Let's go down here to a graph of all of these 50 stocks here. What you'll notice is in the middle is the white line. That is the S&P 500. Then we have the top performance in green right here. That's Avgo or Broadcom. We got the worst performance right here in dark red. And then what I tried to do, which I don't normally do, but what I tried to do is make the thickness of each of these lines dependent on their weighting in the assets. So the top one, two, three, four, five, six here that are all above 4%, they had the thickest lines, green, red, we had a blue one here. So they're kind of interspersed in here. And then the next level was for those between three and 4%, slightly, slightly smaller line and then slightly smaller and smaller based on their weighting. So you can see a lot of thin, thin lines of which the impact was much lower on the overall ETF. What you see is that for the most part, a lot of these stocks performed very similarly to each other, but most of them underperformed the S&P 500. We only had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like I said, that overperformed compared to the S&P 500, but quite a few that dramatically underperformed the S&P 500. Here's a look at total income for the ETF 2023 year to date. Most income actually came from Ford, and this I thought was very interesting. Ford generated $110 for the ETF. Based on the assumption of $100 being invested here, the top income producer was Ford, and that's because partly because they paid a special distribution earlier in the year of 80 cents compared to what was much lower normally. So I don't expect that to continue in the future. Next up was Altria Group, which we would expect here generated $87 based on this assumption, followed by Verizon Wireless right here. Worst performer from an income standpoint was Illinois Toolworks right here, ITW, followed by ADP and LMT right here. And here's a look at the total returns graphed here from largest to smallest, assuming a $1,000 investment in each of these dividend stocks. Worst performance here, as we knew, was Pfizer, worth only $579.78 after this full year, starting with $1,000. Best performer right up here, Avgo, worth $2,092. This ETF is very systematically put together. It is reconstituted on an annual basis, and there's no care or, or regard given to what public perception of a stock is. It's, bare, it's very fundamental based. Dividend growth rate, dividend yield, the fundamental factors, cash to total debt, etc. Which means that every year they have the opportunity to cut the fat, which means we should see dramatically underperforming stocks cut from the index next year. And we will make a note to look at the reconstitution of SCHD when it occurs in March of 2024. Hopefully you found some value in this video, guys. Make sure to leave your two cents down in the comments below. It is my goal to respond to as many comments as possible on the day I post a new video. And again, this spreadsheet is available to those members of the Patreon community. If you're interested in joining, check out the link down in the description below. That's all I got for you guys. Have a great rest of your day and thanks for watching.